Good morning to all of those who are joining us uh, for the live stream from the Smith Cove Baptist Church this Sunday, April 14th. The topic sermon today, why is Jesus Christ the only way to God? This is a question that many people have, maybe even sometimes believers. Well, I'm hoping after you stay with me through the sermon that you'll have that answer. Our scripture readings both come from Romans, and I'm hoping that the Lord will bless these scriptures to our spirit and souls. Romans 1, verses 18 to 25. The wrath of God is being uh, revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human or birds or animals or reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. And then from Romans, a couple chapters down the road, we'll call it Romans 3, verses 21 to 26. This is why Christ is the only way. But now, apart from the law of righteousness of God, there has been made known to the law and the prophecies how they testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his patience, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. And he did, it, he did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. Though as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we ask that you write your word and your message upon our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Every now and again, I get a sermon topic. I start the sermon with some scriptures, of course, notes and sources. And then the whole message kind of gets tucked away, gets buried in the, the multiple files that's in the computer because it's not ready to deliver. Today's message is one of those. It, it started back when COVID began and we started doing the live stream. And there was a number of topics to share with folks who maybe for the first time were thinking about a relationship with God. If you think back a few years ago, people were fearful. What's this COVID stuff all about? And what's it going to mean? So people, maybe news to me or new to me, were searching, but knew little to nothing about God. Many had questions, basic questions, and what they thought they knew from other people who may not have had the Bible as a source, some of what they knew was wrong or at the very least misguided. So I started making up some messages. And I labeled these topics Bible 101. The messages were formed for those who didn't have a, a biblical background, and so it's kind of Bible basics. Now, concerning our message today, most cultures, peoples of the world, they will admit likely that they believe in God, not all people of all cultures. But the question that comes up first from non-believers or those who are searching for God is, is this, what makes Jesus Christ? The only way. What makes a Christian faith the only way as opposed to all those other religions out there, the major ones like Islam or what the Hindus or Buddhists believe? Who is right? 
and what, and what God is the one true God. I know of people who won't lay a hold of the Christian faith because they feel for these other people of other religions. It doesn't seem fair. All religions, except for the Christian faith, have people striving to get to God by their own merits, by their own good works. They believe that they can reach heaven. Even while we all have to admit that we all fall short of complete holiness, and especially if we compare our holiness to God's holiness. So how is it that we can work our way to be holy enough to approach the most holy almighty God on our own? We cannot. No one can. The Christian faith is the only religion that has God reaching out to us. It's his holiness that he gives or ascribes to us through Jesus Christ. That, in a nutshell, is why Jesus Christ is the only way. It's not a holiness of our own that we, we have. Can you or I admit that we're not completely holy? Well, there's a few. Okay. Can we expect to be able to approach God who is the source of holiness, who is absolutely and completely holy? No. And that's why we need Jesus Christ. So let me take apart those scripture readings that I shared. I'm going to do it backwards. I'm going to start with Romans 3 first. The apostles writing to the church in Rome. He's writing to us today because we're digging into these scriptures. And keep in mind, this is after Jesus Christ has resurrected from the grave. He's returned to heaven. And now Paul's writing, well, to the church in Rome. He says, now, apart from the law of righteousness of God, there's a new way. Actually, it reads, but now apart from the law of righteousness of God has been made to know. It's always been known to them through the law and the prophets, the Old Testament. And what that means is before Christ, righteousness for the Jews came and was dependent upon keeping the laws of God, obeying all the rules. Hmm. But we know that wasn't possible. They were sinful. They were doing things against God's law all the time. Now, seeing Christ, who is God in the flesh, now that he has come, there's a new way of righteousness that came into being. And in verse 22, he says, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who will believe. To all, Jew and Gentile, Jew or Arab, Jew or Hindu, Jew or Buddhist. Paul says, and this is a well-known scripture, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified. Freely, by his grace, through the, the redemption that came to us through Jesus Christ. This is an important aspect of this new righteousness. This righteousness that was prior to Christ, the law and the scriptures. They were solely for God's people, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation. It wasn't supposed to be available to us, the non-Jewish people, referred to as Gentiles. It wasn't available to us just yet. The presence and righteousness of, of God was given to the Jews, and they were supposed to, in time, they were supposed to reveal God to the rest of humanity. Well, that did get completed in part through Jesus Christ because he was a Jew. And there's a whole whack of sermons that could be preached on that, but we're not going to dive into that today. So since the book of Exodus, we have the Jews seeking God and, and having available to them a righteousness that could be applied to them so that they could be in relationship with God. It was a righteousness by faith. We first learned of that in Genesis. It all started between God and Abraham. There's another sermon. But as Paul tells us, now that God had come in the person of Jesus Christ, there's a new source, there's a new way of righteousness available. The old has been, I don't want to say replaced, but a better way to say it is that Christ fulfilled the law perfectly, and he did it for us. No human had ever lived a perfect and sinless life like Jesus. And so now this righteousness comes through God's grace, through Jesus and his sacrifice, and our faith in him. It's 
really that simple. In the Old Testament, we had the sacrificial system that had been put into place so that when you broke God's laws, you had to sacrifice animals. A price had to be paid. Mainly, when you read through the Old Testament, it talked a lot about sheep. They were in perfect condition. There was no defects. And their blood was shed to atone for or to cover up the broken law or the sin. The Gospels teach us that Jesus was and is the once and for all sacrificial lamb of God. We paid particular focus on that a couple of weeks ago as we celebrated Easter. But here in our reading from Paul this morning, he shows us in Romans that Jesus Christ was and is that sacrifice given by God. In verse 25, he says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. God does this to demonstrate his righteousness. Even in the New International Version, it says, because in his forbearance, that's a complicated word, it's not a real, but, but wouldn't it be just nice to say, because of God's patience, he left the sins that had been committed before Jesus, he left that unpunished. And he did that, God did that to demonstrate his righteousness. God's showing us that he is the one who justifies those who have faith in Christ. You or I do not have any righteousness of our own. We cannot justify ourselves. God has done it all. So all of those sins before Jesus had been covered over. They had been temporarily atoned for. But the punishment for breaking those laws, it kind of had been on hold, so to speak. So the punishment of sin, of course, is death. It's eternal separation from God. Jesus has fixed this by taking that punishment for us. So back to the question, how can Jesus be the only way to God? Some might argue, how can Christ be the only way? What about all of those who have never heard of Jesus? Are they hell bound? No. We can see clearly and early in the book of Romans where Paul had an explanation of, of God putting in all humans I like to call it a homing device that seems to nudge us and encourage and tell us that there is a God of creation. Even more, that there's eternity. Through Ecclesiastes, I remember reading where uh, he, the writer says, God has set eternity in the hearts of humanity. So we have a choice, Paul says. Will we worship the creator? Or will we worship uh, Focus on worshiping the created. Creator or created. The created can be anything that God has created and that we desire. We desire what's created more than God himself, the creator. So for some, the created, it might be money. It might be possessions. It might be pleasure or pride. That list is lengthy. But here's a bit of how Paul explains that no one has an excuse to deny God. In verse 18, he says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people. They suppress the truth by their wickedness. And he says, since what might be known of God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. That's that homing device. That inner feeling that there is a God who created all things. And Paul goes on, he says, since the beginning, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, they're visible. His eternal power and divine nature, it's been clearly seen. Even more so in our day and age, science is proving God all the time. He says it's been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. And Paul says, so no one is without excuse. So in a nutshell, we as humans we can sense God in what we observe in our world, in creation. And most would say, if honest, and I can't explain it, but I sense that there's a grand creator, a designer. But I can't say for certain, this is other people, okay? I'm saying for certain it's God. Others will say, but I can't say for certain it's God or the God of the Bible. And there are people 
maybe not aware, but you know, people who call God the man upstairs, the big guy, many of us have done it. Or the one who caused the big bang. Once we find God, we don't need to use those vague names anymore. He has a name, Jesus Christ. We know who he is. So we're all able to sense God, but then there's the problem. Us, humans. Verse 21, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But because people get smart in their own minds, they think that they're smarter than God. Paul says their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. They claimed to be wise, but they became fools. And they exchanged God's glory. The immortal God, they exchanged his glory. And they're giving their glory that's due to God. They're giving it to statues and, and idols and animals and trees and you name it. It can be a God. So people can sense God, but humanity doesn't give God what God wants. And what is it that God wants? He wants our best. He wants our worship. He wants our hearts, our will. This is why we exist. We don't exist for us. Sorry. That's a news headline for you. But instead, humanity, because of the simple desires that we have, because we are deceived by Satan, we chase after all the stuff that God has created rather than seeking God, the creator. So what does God do? God does not force anybody to believe in him. There are some religions out there that force people, and Christianity has been guilty of this in the past. But even today, there are, are religions that if you don't accept us, well, if you don't convert, you're dead. But basically, God says, if you want to ignore me and you don't want to seek me, go for it. I'm not going to force you. But by ignoring God, he's saying that you're going to be more susceptible to Satan's lies. You'll end up sinning more and more, and you're going to fall further and further away from God. And Paul sums it up in the next couple of verses. He says, therefore, God gave them over to their sinful desires. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. What are the lies? Well, there's other ways to God other than Jesus. Some Christians believe that. Smarten up. Read your Bible. There is no other way to Christ or to God other than Jesus Christ. They exchanged the truth for a lie that we evolved from a single cell amoeba. Mathematically impossible. There's science. It's just not. That's another sermon. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. That's where humanity sits. Many people are left in this condition. They ignore God or refuse to believe in him and his word. Satan continues along in deceiving and confusing people who don't know the word. They don't read it. So they have doubts. Like how do we know God exists or how do we know that Jesus is the only way? In the same sinful denial, many paint the Christian faith as exclusive. Well, it can't be the only way. That's being exclusive. That's not being fair. That's not true. Jesus tells us that everyone can come to him. It is true, though, that believing in Christ, yes, this is going to exclude all other gods, all other man-made religions. And their misguided beliefs. And why is that? Because there are false gods. So having Christ being the only true way to God is not having the Christian faith being exclusive at all. It's not being unfair. Jesus' sacrifice is for all who will accept it. Jew and Gentile, remember. Interesting that the, normally the people to, who say Christianity is exclusive... They won't commit to God or any particular religion. And for example, if you were born in a Muslim country, you would have likely been taught its religious system. Any of the major religions teach what they've been culturally 
exposed to. We didn't see a lot of this confusion as we grew up or the argument. We didn't see that kind of argument in our, our part of the world because uh, up until this generation or so, the Christian faith had been taught and accepted by society as a whole. Not everyone believed, but most. But there's some who don't accept any God of creation who say that the Christian faith is exclusive. They don't seem to realize that Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists, are they not all making the claim as well that their way is the only way? How old are these major religions and their beliefs? Now, I know you can't believe everything you read on Google, but if you Google, Hinduism is somewhere around 5,500 to 6,000 years old. Whether it's that old or not, I don't know. There's close to a billion followers today. Some say it's the oldest religion. It encompasses many gods and goddesses, but the focus is on a single di uh, deity named Brahim. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Now, Hindus, they believe that when one dies, you come back again in another form. And you keep doing that until you're good enough to gain salvation or moksha, if I'm pronouncing that right. You're basically, you're working your way to you're good enough and holy enough to reach eternal life, which we would consider heaven. The Buddhists or so, it's not as old, 500 or so BC. There's a hundreds of, a few hundred million followers. And they too, like the Hindus, they believe in reincarnation. I was an ant once, and then I was a bird, and I was a cat. I know, being sarcastic, but it's kind of where it is. They believe in this reincarnation and the same results. The goal is nirvana. But they actually don't believe in a god per se. Muslim. Islam. The prophet Muhammad began this religion somewhere around 700 AD. Actually, its roots are in Judaism, as Muslims at one point in time, and still do for some, believe in much of the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch. The Muslims of the Middle East, Arab ones, are half-brothers to the Jews. And yet this conflict. I've gone into this before in great detail. I won't do it today for time, but Abraham's first son was born from a maid. Wow. His name is Ishmael. He's the father of the Arab tribes, the legitimate promised son. God promised Abraham and his wife, Sarah, a son. And in their old age, they had a son. He's the promised son, Isaac. And from Isaac, we have Jacob. Jacob fathers the 12 tribes of Israel. It appears that the Arabs didn't like the story, and they say that Ishmael was the legitimate son of Isaac, and hence this feud, some of what you watched on TV last night, if you were watching. There's another religion, Judaism, Christians. Prior to Christ, we have 4,000 years of recorded history of the Jews. That's in your Old Testament. It's right there in front of you. And from the Jewish faith, we have the Christian faith to include the last 2,000 years. So we have over 6,000 years. We even have the genealogy and the timelines to trace family trees from 6,000 years ago back to Adam and Eve. One God, a trinity consisting of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's no other religion that has a book that does that. Oh, yes, there's books. The Bible traces the people from creation, their relationship with God, not to mention the prophecy that's contained in this, some of it unfolding before our very eyes. No other man-made God does this. And again, all these religions have humans working to get to God, while we as Christians, we're not working our way to God. He's provided us a way to come to him. Jesus. God came to us. Why is Christ the only way? Sin. All the sins. Yes, your sins, my sins. 
They pile up. And by accepting God's sacrifice, the sacrifice he's provided, and this is Christ, and thus having God coming to us, these sins are forgiven if we'll accept his provided holy sacrifice. You don't have any of these other gods sacrificing themselves. Now, for the person who rejects Christ, are they denied heaven because of their sins? Yes and no. Yes, because they haven't received the forgiveness of those sins. But they have not denied, they're not denied heaven because of all of those sins. There's one sin in particular. I believe it's the one that people refer to as the unforgivable sin. That rejecting God, rejecting Jesus, basically is calling the most holy God, the creator of all things, the father of Jesus Christ, calling him a liar. I don't believe your word. Rejecting his truth and his ways. And thus God doesn't send anyone to hell. Each person makes that own decision on their own to accept or reject the truth. You may not like what's being said. You take that up with God, not your pastor. All people of all cultures, nations, ethnic groups, they have a sense of God, of creator. Some maybe never ever hearing of Jesus Christ in the last 2,000 years. That's getting a little bit more impossible these days, but. Or how could they have heard of Jesus Christ before Jesus existed? God's going to judge each and every person according to the heart and soul. Did the person worship the creator? Or did the person worship the created? Paul says, remember, no one's without excuse. And even in today's day and age with the gospel being preached everywhere, but many didn't seem to have a real chance. There's some, maybe people we've known in our lifetime, man, we're we're putting the robe on, we're putting the judge's robe on, we got that white wig on, and we're judged now. That person, they're going to hell. They died. What a hellion they were. What a bad person they were. They never had a chance. Look how they were raised. Let's not be the judge, because we're not. God's going to know who's had the chance. But for most of us living in this part of the world, we've all been exposed to God through Jesus Christ all of our lives. We have no excuse at all. We can sense God in creation. But do we ignore that and use creation for our own benefit, for our own glory, for our own self-serving purposes. Do we ignore God, the creator, and worship the created instead? But as we're exposed to God through Christ, bit by bit, conversation by conversation, scripture verse by scripture verse, and then we're poised with the question that comes to our individual minds, For some, it's been a thousand times over that it's come to their heart and mind. Should I believe in this God that I think is out there? Should I believe this stuff about Jesus Christ? Should I believe in God and what his word says is the truth? And that Jesus is the only way? If a person continues to reject that solution, continues to reject God and his son, in the end, that person is called called God a liar, have rejected God and have sentenced themselves to an eternity without God. God is loving and forgiving and our heavenly creator. We're not all God's children. We're only his children as we accept his son, because then we are adopted. And in God's wisdom and his mercy, his grace, he makes This makes him the utmost and fair judge. No one's going to be separated from God unless that person chooses to do so. So once we come to the fact that God is holy, that he is and that he's holy, that he's just and that he loves us, and that's a problem for many of us as Christians. Can God really love me? We can trust to know 
that he's able to help us. We can trust God that he's able to deal with everyone else. This takes off the job of us being the judge of others. God's offer of salvation through Jesus, it's not exclusive. It's inclusive. It's for all people of all nations, Jew and Gentile, if they will but trust him. No one who's done any research will argue the fact that science of the world tells us that human life started in the Middle East, just about where the scriptures say that it started. I'm kind of rewinding here, but I'm going to wrap this up. God chose a man, one, from all the people of the earth. And he said, Abram, I've seen you living in your father's land and home with all that wealth. But I see something in you, Abram. He becomes Abraham. And I like it. And I want to bless you. And I want to bless the whole world through you. You'll find that in Genesis. So God chose Abraham. And from there on, we have God revealing himself to the world through Abraham and his descendants. That is the Jewish people. That is the Bible. We have 4,000 years of recorded history of that story from creation and God forming the nation of Israel. When you read the Old Testament, it's not pretty at times. People are nasty. You know, you people like murder mysteries, read the Old Testament. You'll find it. There's that there. One more reason to believe the Bible, because if you and I were writing a big, long book about our family, which you wouldn't, but if you were writing about your family, you would pretty that, you would flower that up. Everybody would be nice. There wouldn't be anybody backstabbing. There'd be no wars. All that stuff. Someone just said one page. Yeah, you'd still make it as nice and pretty as you could. But what we have in the Old Testament is the truth, good, bad, or indifferent. The Jewish people were quite nasty at times. The family feuds. Well, we're looking at one in the Middle East right now. God didn't allow the people who he had write the scriptures to flower it up. This is how it is. It's one more reason to believe that it's true. And if you've been listening to the sermons over the years, you'll know that you've heard me remind people that often, so often, Satan is a liar. He's a master deceiver. He draws people away from the one true living God, and he injects all sorts of thoughts and confusion about God and Jesus and his spirit. His spirit who dwells and helps us, encourages and guides humanity to the truth. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the voice in the mind saying, trust God. And if anyone listening to the message hasn't accepted Jesus, yet you've heard or you've read of invitations to accept Jesus, that is the work and power of the Holy Spirit. It speaks to our hearts and minds, trying to pull us out of Satan's trap and accept the truth because Satan is just lying. There is but one way to God, and this is through God in the flesh, Jesus Christ. And for any of us as believers to water down the scriptures and try to appease people if we happen to be in confrontation about that particular subject. If we want to water down the scriptures or, or ignore scriptures and try and appease people by being open to other ways to God. For anyone that's claiming to be a Christian and are thinking that way, you best get your Bible open and start reading it. Or maybe you should just cross off the thing when you have to, oh, religion, Christian. Maybe you shouldn't write Christian anymore. Our world is spinning out of control. God's word in our Bibles is the source of truth that we can lay hold of. Many of the believers sitting here in front of me have, have held on to the word of God in Christ and has seen us through much. Even as I speak God's word and his promises written within it are coming into reality before our very eyes. There's no man-made God that has given us the future written down with 100% accuracy. None of them. 
No God except one. The one true risen and living God, Jesus Christ. So accept that truth. Praise him and thank him for saving you. And give God the glory that's due to his name. Give God the glory for his sacrifice that he's made. God came and died for us. If you're a non-believer listening, accept Jesus into your life. Accept him into your belief system right now because in five minutes it could be too late. I'm out of time. Heavenly Father, help us to be aware of Satan's deceptive plans. How he leads us, the world, into believing that there's all sorts of different ways to you, Lord God. You have made it so plain through your scriptures. Satan's such a deceiver, he won't even tell people, Lord, to not read the Bible. He'll just say, read it tomorrow. Don't read it today. Cunning. Lying, thieving. Lord, you're none of those things. And your word proves it. Help us to take that stand, Lord. Unequivocal, non-negotiable. You, Lord Jesus, are the only one true way to the Heavenly Father. You are God. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit on our lives and for us to be listening, not just hearing your word, but being doers of the word too. We know we can't work our way to you, Lord. You've done all that work already. Have you said in your scriptures through James, we have faith and by our faith, because of our faith, we will have works. We'll do things for you in gratitude towards you. We thank you for those opportunities, Lord, where you would use us. Heavenly Father, be with those who are mourning in our communities, for the loss of loved ones. Those of us who in the congregation or those listening online, Lord, those of us who are facing surgeries or Dealing with illnesses, Lord, we ask for healing. We ask for solutions. Those in the hospital in long-term care, those recovering from surgery, we ask for, for healing, lifted spirits, and strength for the journeys. Lord, we lift up these prayers to you through our Lord Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Blessings to each and every one of you and your families near and far. I still haven't figured out a phrase to leave you with, but remember, you need touch up, a little washing, wash the feet. God bless. <laughs>